Well, hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs on most Thursdays, so please check out our website for information on upcoming programs. We're able to offer these programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship of Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, we're so grateful for that. Thank you. While these programs are free to watch, I do encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. You know, your support as a member helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So just a quick note about tonight. If you have any questions during the program, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them during the latter portion of the program. So with that, let's begin. It is my great pleasure to welcome back to Figgy Programming, Dr. Brandon Brame Fortune. Chief Curator Emerita of the National Portrait Gallery. Dr. Fortune, who retired in 2020, congratulations, worked in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the National Portrait Gallery since 1987. In 2011, she assumed the role of Chief Curator, where she oversaw all curatorial departments, the Conservation Department, and the Museum's Research Archive. Her primary research areas have been in the 18th and 19th century American port portraiture area, including the work of Charles Wilson Peel and women portraitists of the latter, the later 19th century. So many of our audience members today may recall Dr. Fortune when she was um, the chair of the curatorial team that created the Portraiture Now series of exhibitions. That series included the work of our, our own Rose Franson and was a precursor to the Figgy's acquisition and display of our much beloved portrait of Makoka. Dr. Fortune is joined tonight by her adorable dog, Sadie, whom you may hear barking her love, her own love of American art in the background during the presentation. I wanna say welcome Sadie and welcome Dr. Fortune. It's great to be working with you again on this program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Melissa. And good evening, everyone. I hope everything is working here the way it should. Um, I am very glad to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight. I'd like to thank the Figgy Art Museum for inviting me to create this talk and to Melissa Moore specifically for all of her valuable assistance. I visited the Figgy several years ago, as Melissa mentioned, when one of Iowa's great artists, Rose Franson, was showing her work. So I do know the exhibition spaces and I am sure that for America, an exhibition featuring works from the collection of the National Academy of Design in New York City is looking wonderful in your museum. I was asked to provide some context for the exhibition, specifically for the self-portraits included in For America. As you may know, the National Academy of Design in New York City is an institution which was founded in 1826 as a new artist-run institution meant to provide a haven for more progressive artists who were breaking away from the more traditional American Academy headed by John Trumbull, an artist whose best years were behind him. Based on the Royal Academy in London, it provided exhibition space for artists through annual shows and became a teaching institution as well. It also became more traditional over the years as institutions can do. But from the beginning, the Academy required newly elected academicians to give an example of their work to the institution, starting a collection. By 1839, those who were elected as associate members, a first step toward full membership, were also required to submit a portrait of themselves, which could be a self-portrait. Therefore, the Academy's collection is full of portraits, and there are approximately 1,200 self-portraits within that collection. Because the National Portrait Gallery has about 550 self-portraits in its collections, and because I curated an exhibition featuring a selection of them for the Portrait Gallery in 2018, I was invited to speak to you tonight. I love looking at the images in For America, and I envy you the chance to see the actual paintings. The National Academy of Design's collection was built by the artist members themselves 
over nearly 200 years, and it expresses that history. The National Portrait Gallery, where I was a curator until my retirement last year, was founded by an act of Congress in 1962 and opened its doors in 1968 with a mission to collect and exhibit portraits of people who had a significant impact on the history and culture of the United States and to examine the history of portraiture. Since 2001, we have also collected portraits of contemporary living subjects so that our collections and programming better express the diversity of the history and culture that is being made now. So, two very different institutions, but there's a common thread in self-portraits. We will look at some fine examples of self-portraits from For America that you can see at the Figgy starting this week and I'll compare and contrast them with work from the National Portrait Gallery's collection. Melissa, could we have the first slide? Thank you. So let's think about self-portraits. Many of us snap selfies all the time and post them to social media or share with family and friends. We may even refine and edit those images to better express how we want to be perceived. But artists take far more time in creating their self images. And they ask us to stop, to slow down and ponder those likenesses to see what we might be able to learn. Here is one very famous self portrait by Rembrandt dated 1659 from the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. What are we seeing? A public persona? a glimpse of a private personal self. Artists usually intend for others, contemporaries or posterity or both, to view their self-portraits and may choose to reveal aspects of themselves in the process. And yet self-portraits as works of art are inherently products of the imagination. The artist depicts herself not by looking inward but by looking at what others see. We will likely feel a strong sense of presence and we may learn something about the person through the choices that they have made about expression, pose, clothing, or objects included in the portrait. We might also see something of the shifting consideration of the artist's role in society or their engagement as activists for causes important to them. We may see them in moments of quiet meditation or reflection. So with this background, let's begin to look at some portraits created closer to our own time and place. Next, next slide. Thank you. Here are two extraordinary self-portraits of leading American artists, Mary Cassatt on the left and Alice Neal on the right. They are treasures of the National Portrait Gallery's collection and both works, so different in effect and execution, assert strongly the talent and confidence of the subjects. On the left, Cassatt's self-portrait is a rare example of a self-image of the artist and shows her at work, although we do not see her active hands, but we see a suggestion of her drawing board on the right side. It is a watercolor from around 1880, at just the time when she began to show in Paris, her paintings of women and of mothers with children with the Impressionists, invited by her good friend and colleague, Edgar Degas. Raised to wealth and privilege in the United States, Cassatt was determined to find success as an independent artist. Although she had to leave Paris, where she had been studying at the time of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. She soon returned to Europe, traveling and studying in Italy and Spain, and then settled again in Paris in the early 1870s. We can see her clear fourth white presentation of self, her assurance with the difficult medium of watercolor and her mastery of it. She is in a sunlit room. One can see the light behind her and on the sketchily indicated wallpaper to the right. On the right of the screen, here is Alice Neal at 80 
an avowed feminist, finally receiving recognition in her 70s after over 30 years of working figuratively during the heyday of abstraction. As she said at the time, life begins at 70. I'll discuss this painting in more depth later in my talk. It's just important to see that both women use self-portraiture to assert their agency as artists and their place in a male-dominated art world. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now let's look at two self-portraits of a founder of the National Academy of Design, Samuel F. B. Morse. In both, he is very young, just beginning to study art and embark on his first career as an artist. By 1837, um, almost 20, over 20 years after these portraits were done, disappointed that hoped for commissions for grand historical paintings were not materializing, he turned to his concurrent work on the telegraph and the rest is history. But here on the left, we see the Academy's small miniature portrait of Morse when he is only 18, holding his palette and brush, announcing his profession. On the right is the National Portrait Gallery's small painting from 1812 when he is 21, which is a study for a larger painting belonging to the Addison Gallery at Phillips Academy. As scholars have pointed out, the profile pose is a reference to neoclassical art of the time, and he may be wearing a red trimmed academic gown. He is more mature and presenting us with a more refined, even poetic image. Next slide. Next, let's examine two portraits of Daniel Huntington. On the right is a formal portrait from the later years of the artist's life in the collections of the National Academy of Design. He is seated, looking straight out at us and indicates his history of the knowledge, his sorry, his knowledge of the history of art by holding a sheaf of reproductions of paintings with what appears to be a painting, a drawing of a painting by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael on top. Such reproductions were becoming very popular by the 1890s. Huntington had a very long career and served as president of the National Academy of Design twice in the 1860s and again about a decade later. On the left is a portrait of him when he was 50 years younger and a student of the New York artist who painted him, Henry Inman. It's a charming, warm image of a young man brimming with goodwill and intelligence. It's not a self-portrait, but it gives us a very different view of Daniel Huntington. This painting hung in my office in the National Portrait Gallery in the 1990s, and I loved looking at it every day. Next slide. Next, I want to compare two self-portraits of Cecilia Bow, who was one of the most accomplished portrait painters of the later 19th century in the United States. She studied with William Merritt Chase and then studied further in Paris. She had a long career as an artist and rivaled Chase and John Singer Sargent with the deftness of her brushwork and the psychological penetration of her likenesses. On the left is the glorious self-portrait she presented to the National Academy of Design in 1895. A bust length work, it highlights her ruddy complexion and bright eyes looking off to the left rather than directly at us. On the right is a smaller, less highly finished portrait from perhaps a bit earlier in her career. Scholars have never been certain about the dating. It is almost always on view at the National Portrait Gallery. Although Bo wasn't the first woman elected to membership in the Academy, she was one of the best known in her day. Next slide. Now, as we move into the 20th century, I think it's interesting that the poses, lighting and coloring of artists' self-portraits becomes much more varied and their message is sometimes more nuanced. Here are two painted self-portraits from almost the same time. On the left, 
is a likeness of Daniel Garber, an American Impressionist artist who lived in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And we can see, as you can see on all of the, um, the captions on the uh, PowerPoint, that this, like many of the portraits in For America, was um, his associate of the National Academy diploma presentation. That means it's the portrait that he was asked to submit as the first step toward becoming an academician. Although Garber had studied in Paris during the first decade of the 20th century, he was looking at impressionist work, uh, which the work was still being done, but that was a, an art movement that began in the 1870s and 80s. So he's looking at that work rather than the paintings of the more avant-garde artists working in Paris at the same time. I really like the clarity of the bright daylight illuminating his face and the wall behind him, as well as his very direct gaze. And on the right, from almost exactly the same time, is a self-portrait from the National Portrait Gallery's collection that depicts Lee Simonson, who left painting behind and went on to have an important career as an American theatrical designer in the 1920s and 1930s. Here in a painting probably created a self-portrait when he was studying modern art in Paris, just a few years after Daniel Garber was there, he has painted himself into a still life worthy of Gauguin or Cezanne, signaling his allegiance with those giants of French art and all that he had learned in Paris during the few years that he was there. Next slide. On the left is a self-portrait from the National Academy's collection of Gertrude Fisk, a New England artist who painted portraits and figure studies in Boston and in Maine for her entire career. In this case, I believe that she is showing us forthrightly the mirror image she is seeing as she depicts herself. We see her truncated palette in the lower left, a canvas on the right, and in the background, a lighted window shining into the darkened space of her studio. I wonder if she was familiar with John Singer Sargent's interiors made in Venice in the late 19th century with similar dark corridors illuminated with bright light. And on the right, is one of my favorite works in the National Portrait Gallery's collection, a small self-portrait of Lucy May Stanton, a Southern-born artist who spent much time in her native Georgia, in the Georgia mountains, but who had trained and worked as well in Boston and Philadelphia. Her portrait is titled The Silver Goblet, though scholars have not discovered the meaning of the silver vessel. It does provide her an opportunity to show off her skill, however, and you can see the reflections, which are quite beautiful. The painting is only about five and a half by almost four inches, and it is done in watercolor on ivory with a wet in wet technique that she had mastered. She would put her ivory panel on a board and as she painted using this wet in wet technique, she would turn the board and allow the paint to run and to move around the surface of the ivory in order to get the beautiful effects that you see here. Next slide. On the left is Ellen Emmett Rand's self-portrait from the Academy's collection. It is similar to photographs of her at her easel, including that wonderful hat, which looks as though she borrowed it from her husband. She is posed at her easel, at work, wearing her painting smock, with no pretense. Rand was part of a family of artists. Three of her female cousins were painters as well, and all were part of a socially connected network of elite New England and New York people who were often the subjects of Rand's portraits. Based in New York and in Salisbury, Connecticut, 
she painted hundreds of portraits, including several paintings of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but her work is not well known today. The portraits are strong and well-designed. Luckily, there has recently been an exhibition devoted to her work at the University of Connecticut in 2018, so hopefully her work will become better known. On the right, I've included a small print, a self-portrait of Mabel Dwight from around the same time, and it's in the Portrait Gallery's collection. She poses herself right up against the picture plane, drawing on a lithographic stone. Like Rand, she depicts herself hard at work. Dwight studied art as a young woman in San Francisco, in fact, but after her marriage and living on the East Coast, she did not work as an artist for a number of years. It was not until she was 50 that she traveled to Paris and began to study lithography, which became her favorite medium throughout the 1930s and 40s. Next slide. Oh, hmm, that's strange. Sorry, so sorry, sorry. Could we go to the next slide, please? There, and we'll go back to that. My mistake, I apologize. On the left is a self-portrait of Huey Lee Smith, who studied art in Cleveland and later lived and worked in Detroit before moving to New York City in 1958. After years of effort to achieve success as an artist during the period of Jim Crow, he found his place in the city, creating haunting figurative paintings that had been likened to the work of Edward Hopper or the Italian artist Giorgio de Chirico. He taught at the Art Students League in New York for 15 years and was only the second black artist to be elected to the National Academy of Design after Henry Osawa Tanner, who was elected in 1909. In spite of this recognition by the art world, he did not have a full career retrospective until 1988. Luckily, a scholar, Alona Cooper Wilson, has recently completed a dissertation on Lee Smith and has contributed an essay to the For America catalog. This catalog looks to be just marvelous. It contains a variety of essays and short pieces by leading scholars and artists about the artists and artworks in the exhibition, and it is published by Yale University Press. Now, on the right is a drawing from the National Portrait Gallery collection created by Aaron Douglas, in 1925, you can see the bold signature on the right. When Douglas left his teaching position in Kansas and traveled to New York, to Harlem, thinking only to stop over for a short while before going to Paris for further art study. Instead, he was drawn into the Harlem Renaissance for several years and eventually became a professor of art at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. The drawing reveals his academic training, as it asserts that he has truly mastered traditional drawing techniques. This drawing, made using red Conte crayon, could have been made in the 18th century in France. And yet, Douglas adopted a modernist visual language for his later work and was renowned for murals and other paintings which foregrounded African America. American and Afrocentric subject matter. Next slide. Oh, wait a minute. What happened? There, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> On the right is another portrait of Aaron Douglas, who's drawn self-portrait we just looked at. This is created much later in Douglas's career when he was an established professor at Fisk. It is not a self-portrait, but it was painted by Betsy Graves Renault, who was one of two women artists commissioned by the Harmon Foundation in New York City to create a series of painted portraits of black figures of accomplishment in the United States, including Marian Anderson, Thurgood Marshall, and George Washington Carver. Unlike the young Douglas asserting his very great skill in drawing, 
In this portrait, we see the older professor, pipe in hand, posed in front of one of his artworks. And on the left is a self-portrait of James A. Porter, also created when Porter was at the top of his career, serving as professor of art and art history, and also director of the art gallery at Howard University in Washington, DC. Posed at work with his brush in his hand, he sits in front of a view of Howard Hall, which housed the art department. Next slide. As we move into the later decades of the 20th century, we find so many approaches to portraiture. And in fact, Melissa, if you wouldn't mind going back to, to those two self portraits there, and then we'll, we'll get caught up. Um, we find so many approaches to portraiture and an increasing focus on feminism for women artists and to issues of activism and personal identity for other artists. Here we have two marvelous self-portraits of the realist artist Lois Dodd, who continues to work in her ninth decade of life. I was so excited to see that the Academy also has one of her very rare self-portraits, as does the National Portrait Gallery. Dodd is known for cityscapes created in New York and landscapes, often with gardens or farm animals in Maine using flat areas of luminous color and with a sensitivity to light in those paintings, Dodd's color palette is also evident in these self-portraits with lime greens and pale oranges suffused with light. As she once said, the more you look, the more you see. And again, we're, we're lucky to have a chance to see one of her, her self-portraits in For America. Now, if we can go forward to, go forward two slides. There, now we're good. Another figurative artist working at mid-century and beyond, Will Barnett was also known for stylized representational paintings using flattened areas of color. Like many of the artists I'm talking about tonight, he's painting in a representational mode right through the decades when abstraction was the dominant form of art in New York and in the United States. His portrait for the National Academy at the top, given to the Academy in 1981, is duplicated in the portrait at the bottom of the screen, created around the same time, but retained by the artist until it was offered to the National Portrait Gallery in 2008. Barnett is situated at his studio window, overlooking the water in East Hampton on Long Island. The crow belonged to a neighbor, but crows also appear in a number of paintings around this time. And sometimes they carry mythological or poetic meanings for Barnett. He must have valued this self-portrait image very much to have it represent him at the National Academy of Design. And then years later, in the National Portrait Gallery. And it hangs in our, the portrait gallery's painting hangs in our director's office in our, in our office building, um, but we're not there now. I'm sure she'll be glad to go back and find this painting on her office wall, maybe this summer. Next slide. Here on the left is a large painting from the National Academy of Design collection, a self-portrait of Louisa Mathis daughter, clad in her overalls with her pink kerchief as the only marker of her gender. The setting is her studio and she holds a paintbrush in her left hand. Mathis daughter was from Iceland. She studied in Denmark and in Paris and then moved to New York to study with the famed teacher of many mid-century artists, Hans Hoffmann. By the 1950s and 60s, she was gaining recognition for her stark and direct representational paintings full of broad shapes and spaces and vivid, pure color. By the 1980s, when at around 70 years old, she was elected to the National Academy of Design, she had been lauded for her work for many years. On the right, we see again, the startling nude self-portrait of Alice Neal. 
completed when she was 80 and at the height of the late in life recognition that she finally received after decades of neglect. An avowed feminist, Neil determined to paint figures in her signature expressive representational style, very much like what you see here, going against the abstraction so dominant at mid-century. And she did so for over 30 years, working mainly in New York and living for a while in Harlem before fame found her. In her self-portrait, the only painted self-portrait she ever made, she presents us with full acceptance of her sagging, aging body. It is a striking challenge to the centuries old convention of idealized femininity. She takes the trope of the male artist and his gaze, creating nude images of female models and she turns it on its ear, owning the image and the gaze, taking it all for herself. She does include her paintbrush and a painter's rag to be sure we know just who we are dealing with. Next slide. I'm going to end with three works of art from the National Portrait Gallery collections, all self-portraits, to indicate some of the fascinating directions that contemporary self-portraits are moving in. You'll also see other examples of this varied and exciting work in For America. On the left is Enrique Chagoya's self-portrait with six self-images entitled Aliens Sans Frontières, Aliens Without Borders from 2016. Chagoya, who identifies as Mexican-American, teaches at Stanford University and is known for works in many media, including very complicated and sophisticated prints, such as this one from the Portrait Gallery's collection. All of these last three images, these two and the last one I'll show you, are included in the Portrait Gallery's traveling exhibition, Eye to Eye, 20th Century Self-Portraits, which I curated, which is why I was so delighted to be able to talk about these, these works tonight. Now, Enrique Chagoya had his DNA tested to determine, just as we might see on the PBS show, Finding Your Roots, the complexities of his genetic heritage. He found that his roots included Native Americans from Central Mexico, European peoples, Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, and also ancestors in the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and both East and South Asia. He truly represents the melting pot. In this print, however, he speaks to prejudice by depicting himself using negative visual stereotypes of many of the peoples I've just listed. For Shigoya, the message is that we are all connected and that we need to care for each other. On the right is Roger Shimamura's very large painting, Shimamura Crossing the Delaware from 2010. The painting features Shimamura in the guise of George Washington and the composition is based on Emanuel Leutze's painting from the mid 19th century in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. You can see a silhouette of the original painting in the right background. Shimamura has replaced Washington's Continental Army soldiers with samurai warriors and the entire aesthetic of the painting refers to Japanese printmaking traditions. Roger Shimamura, who has been a professor of art at the University of Kansas for many years, is a Japanese American. His family, who were all American citizens of Japanese descent, were imprisoned in an internment camp in Idaho during World War II when he was a small child. He considers himself an American first, but he focuses in all of his art on the broader experience of Asian Pacific Americans and the obstacles they face. Next slide. And finally, I want to close with a painted self-portrait, the last he made of Fritz Scholder. Scholder gained fame as a painter of Native American subject matter in the 1960s and 70s 
as a member of the new American Indian art movement. As a younger man, he studied in California with pop artist Wayne Tebow and often employed a pop art aesthetic with flat surfaces and bright colors. Shoulder taught in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Institute of American Indian Arts and often mentored younger native artists. But here, his palette is moody and subdued, but the effect is dramatic. His typical sunglasses seem part of a visage that is marked as though scratched and abstracted. Suffering from complications brought on by diabetes, we see the long tubes from his oxygen tank. The gray cat may be a reference to the Egyptian cat Bastet, who served as an escort to the afterlife. The influence which was lifelong of the English artist Francis Bacon is also clear in the painting. As with Alice Neal's self-portrait, we see an honest engagement with old age, and in this case, with the reality of death, which is always with us. Thank you very much for listening to me tonight. I hope that we will have some questions or comments. And again, I apologize for the PowerPoint snafu. I, I made a change and then I evidently didn't save it correctly. So thank you all. Dr. Fortune, thank you so much for that exploration of portraiture. What a wonderful way to, to really help us celebrate this exhibition for America. I do see that we have a comment in the Q&A, just a little note about some local connections here, um, Shigoya was a guest speaker at Augustana College in Rock oh, Island, wonderful. which is part of our community. Yeah, and just a reminder, um, a reminder for our audience members that um, one of his richly textured prints is in that very same collection over at the Augustana Teaching Museum of Art, and you really need to make sure to see his works at close range. I fully it's appreciate true. It. It's true. There's so much. It's, there's the grittiness of street art, there's just this incredible layering of, of printmaking mediums and it's, it's, they're, they're beautiful. Oh, I'm so glad there's another one close at hand. Yeah, in fact, if we looked out, um, out the museum window, we would almost see the, uh, the Augustana Teaching Museum of Art. So thank you, that was the Sherry Maurer who, who shared that information. Um, anybody else who wants to, to jump in with questions, please feel free to do so. Dr. Fortune, we are getting a few comments, just uh, our gratitude from our community for your presentation and how excellent it was. So thank you. Well, it's, it's amazing to have this great exhibition, uh, which I think has been traveling all over the country. So how, how smart of your colleagues at the Big E to, to bring it. Uh, thank you. I'll make sure that our curatorial team gets that, um, that note from you. We also have a note from a docent um, from the NPG who says that she misses you very much. And I know that we had a couple other docents from the National Portrait Gallery who had emailed in anticipation of the program. So I wanna, uh, you know, from one museum staffer who, who loves our docents here to, to yours, I just wanna say thanks to all the docents for all that you do. <laughs> Thank you so much to all docents everywhere who bring your exhibitions to life. Absolutely. All right, so there is a question here, and I know that um, anything, if, if we have questions that come in a little bit later or uh, people wake up in the middle of the night and, and they just have to know, please don't hesitate to email me. You do have my email address, so I'm happy to, to forward those on to Dr. Fortune, even if they come after the presentation. We do have a couple here, though, so I will, I'll jump to those. First is, what is your oldest portrait in the National Portrait Gallery? Oh my goodness. We have some engravings from the very late 17th century or very early 18th century um, in the collection. Um, but for the most part, our collection begins in the early 18th century. Well, thank you for that. And then we have another one. Could you talk about the artist and technique of painting on ivory? What would have been the ivory source? And outside of people who may use this as a local medium, how was this viewed? 
Well, I can say that now, ivory from any source is, is banned. Um, as you may know, there, there are lots of new regulations from the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Service. And portrait miniatures were often made on small pieces of ivory. And I'm not sure what the origin of those pieces of ivory was, if it was from Africa or India, but um, they, were, they were thin pieces, often ovals or rectangles of ivory. And for the most part, artists worked with watercolor and very, very tiny, tiny brushes in the late 18th, early 19th century. And then there was a revival of miniature painting in the later 19th century. And those were often done by, by women. Um, and they became a bit larger. So by the time we get to Lucy May Stanton's time period in the early 20th century, she's building on the work that had been done in the 1880s and 90s, um, mainly I said by, by women artists, um, but she took it a little further. For the most part, the work is very, very, uh, the brushwork is tiny and the strokes are minute. And so in something like a, a tiny miniature done by Charles Wilson Peel in 1780, which is about the size of my thumb um, in our collection, Lucy May Stanton was working in a much larger way, even though her miniature is only about this big, but she was able to tilt and let the watercolor run. And because the ivory, in spite of the fact that we, we want to protect the sources of ivory and for elephants completely now, when it was used, it provided for a very luminous substrate for the paint. And so miniatures often seem to glow because of the way that light can shine through the ivory. So it was very much sought after for many, many years, um, but it is definitely not used today and museums, um, cannot purchase um, works, antique works made of, of ivory. I think there's an exception sometimes for musical instruments with tiny inlays of ivory. Um, but we can, we can accept something that is clearly an antique made, you know, maybe centuries ago as a gift, but that's, that's where we are. And I think that's a good thing. Oh, that's so interesting. Thank you for kind of delving into that for us. And thank you for the question. Um, all right, so here's another one. Is there an explanation as to why an artist would make two versions of his self portrait? Are there others who did so? Um, you know, I think in the case of, of Will Barnett, it was clearly a very successful painting. And by doing another version of it, it the time he may have just wanted to keep it in the studio and they have been I don't know I do not know the answer so I'm sort of making it up but it turned out to be wonderful for the portrait gallery because then in around 2008 when he and his wife offered it to us we certainly recognized his accomplishments as an artist and we were very happy to have this brilliant self-portrait so you know I don't I'm trying to think if there are other instances of, of an exact replica by the artist of a self-portrait. And I can't think of one right now, but I'll probably wake up in the middle of the night and think of it. Well, no, and thank you for that. I know we're putting you on the spot here. Um, if, yeah, it goes the same to you. If anything comes to you in the middle of the night, I'm happy to email it out to our group. I do see that we have a number of other questions that, that have come in. And so what I'm going to do just to make sure we're being respectful of time, audience members, if you have asked a question, I'm going to grab those questions and um, just take one more right now. And the rest of them, I will communicate with you and with Dr. Fortune about getting those answers to you. So I wanna thank everyone for your questions. I think at this point, I'm gonna wrap up with with one more and then we will, we'll call it a night, all right? So please don't be discouraged as of you who have burning questions. I see them and I'll make sure that we, we get those answered. Um, all right, so would the National Portrait Gallery consider asking artists who are commissioned to do presidential portraits to submit a self-portrait? Could you ask that again so I, yep. I 
So with the National Portrait Gallery, consider asking artists, artists who are commissioned to do presidential portraits to submit a self-portrait. And uh, the specific um, example then is with Amy Sherald who did Michelle Obama's portrait. Ah, would, would, would we ask an artist like yes. Amy Sherald to submit a self-portrait? Yeah. That's a fascinating and wonderful idea. Um, I, I don't officially represent the museum anymore. I'm retired, um, but I'll certainly pass that along to my colleagues, you know, in, in, an, in homage to the National Academy of Design, right? That would, be, that would be a very interesting thing to do. We have not done so, so far. Well, thank you for considering that and for passing that on. I have made note of the, the rest of the questions. And I, again, I wanna thank our audience for this lively um, Q&A. We will get the rest of those answered after the program through email. And Dr. Fortune, I just wanna thank you again for this wonderful exploration of portraiture for your time always in preparing for this, but also just sharing with us tonight. It's been such a pleasure to reconnect with you. We, we wish you were here in person like you were a few years ago. Well, I know, although it, um, it has been very cold, so maybe you're glad that you're not here in person <laughs> at this moment. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure and um, Iowa is one of my favorite places. Ah, thank you. Well, we, we like it here and we'll, we'll try to get you back when it's safe to do so and nice and sunny and warm. So I know that you, the rest of our guests are very excited to see the exhibition for America in person. This is going to be on display through May 16th at the Figgy. So for those of you who do plan to visit the museum in person, please remember to check out our website. That's gonna have up-to-date information on our current policies and procedures for visiting the museum. And for those of you who are unable to visit or who are not yet ready to visit the museum in person, we hope that you explore the exhibition online. So for that, if you go to our website and you go to the art tab, you'll be able to select virtual exhibitions. And from there, you'll be able to go to our, our microsite of For America. So you're going to be able to go through the exhibition from your computers in a very similar way to if you were in the museum here. You can zoom in on the artworks. Um, it's not quite the same, but if you could get close, this is definitely it. We just launched this a couple of days ago uh, in conjunction with the exhibition, and we're so thrilled to be able to offer it to all of you. So again, if you want to check out the exhibition online, regardless of whether or not you plan to come to the museum, go to the Figgy Art Museum's website, Art tab, and then Virtual Exhibitions, and you'll find your way. So we do hope you'll join us for upcoming virtual programs. These are also listed on our website and they're in our newsletter. Next week, we'll be hearing from Dr. Rennell Knight-Luth as she presents the lecture, Who Was Lila Mecklin, which is also in conjunction with For America. In fact, it's gonna be For America all the time um, now through May 16th. So definitely consult the website and your newsletter and check out other programs. I just wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. It's so wonderful to be celebrating the exhibition with you. Dr. Fortune, can't thank you enough. And we look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Good night.